Downing Street has always been there. It was one of the first lines on the map, running from the White Cliffs of Dover through London and the Midlands into North Wales, a road simultaneously mundane and extraordinary, shaping the modern world and ancient history alike. We are going to take a journey along Watling Street, looking for the island's true face. John Hicks, author of Watling Street, and a man with an uncanny ability to uncover little-known corners of history and culture and make surprising connections between them. John will be our guide in this four-part series. Joining us will be authors Ian Sinclair, Alan Moore, Andy Miller, CJ Stone, poet Selina Godden, John Constable, comedian Miranda Kane, Lord Victor Adebowale and director Daisy Campbell. Watling Street is 450 miles in length and quite hilly in places, so make sure you've packed your waterproofs, stout walking boots and a spare pair of socks. Episode 1, Come On Pilgrim. We want peace. We want love. We want justice for all. The moths are eating everything. Oh, it's the glue man, all right. Most politically inspired person of the year. You're going to regret that, you know. (laughs) So pricketh them nature in their courages. Then long and folk to go on pilgrimages, and palmers for to seek and stranger strands. To distant shrine is known in sundry lands. And especially from every shire's end of England to Canterbury they wend. The holy blissful martyr for to seek that them hath helpen when that they were weak. Our journey begins 20 miles from the start of Watling Street on the road to Canterbury. This city has long been a beacon of spiritual light for pilgrims in both history and fiction, from Chaucer's Canterbury Tales to Powell and Pressburger's 1944 film A Canterbury Tale. But what shines a light also casts a shadow. Until his death in 2009, Canterbury was home to David Seabrook, author of All the Devils Are Here, a book which exposed the dark underbelly of the Kent coastline and has long been the fascination of author Andy Miller. Canterbury is also where Henry II made a pilgrimage to pay penance for the murder of Thomas a Becket, understanding then that political authority must be subservient to the spiritual. The writer C.J. Stone is a keen walker of the Pilgrim's Road across Kent. Under his guidance, we'll uncover curious parallels between Thomas a Becket and Brian Hoare, a man who sacrificed his life in a spiritual war with Tony Blair. A monument to Hoare can be found on Whitstable Beach, and it is here that we make our final pilgrimage and explore the intersections of politics and spirituality along Watling Street. But we begin on the outskirts of Canterbury, in the village of Chillum, better known as the fictional village of Chillingbourne to fans of the film A Canterbury Tale. It is here that the mysterious glue man roams the village at night, pouring glue into young girls' hair in an attempt to curtail amorous encounters with American servicemen. The glue man is a traditionalist who doesn't want his vision of England upset by progress, change and foreigners. His attitude is one that, arguably, still prevails across much of our island. Well, we are walking up a hill that looks uh, spookily familiar from the film A Canterbury Tale. And they, they just arrive by train. There's two soldiers and a, and a land girl. I think it's a land girl. And they just come off the station and it's dark. And this is this very hill we're looking at here, except 75 years ago. Uh, and a mysterious dark figure runs up, puts glue in her hair and runs away. What are you doing? Hey, what's going on? What's that? What's what? Oh, my goodness, it's my hair. Hair? Somebody came out of nowhere and poured something on it. Hi, where are you? What's wrong with your hair? It's some sticky stuff. Sticky stuff? Why, your hair's full of Oh, this is England. Never a dull moment. Such a strange um, start to a film. It's such a strange genre of thing to be in especially as a film that uh, jumps about so much it becomes a becomes a spiritual parable by by the end but again that's what 
uh, Canterbury Tales, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, is all about. It's about just jumping from different uh, genres to genres as different people tell their stories. It's about everything. It's about uh, God's plenty, as it's famously described. Mm. So it's that the film is so um, odd and disjointed and, and tonally all over the place is, is, is exactly right. Do you know about the old road? That's a new one on me. Where is it, Piccadilly? Piccadilly. It's a road, a real one. Okay, what about it? It's the Pilgrim's Road. Where does it go to, this old road? You're standing on it. It goes right here to Canterbury Cathedral. Come on in. You're a pilgrim yourself, but you don't know it. Uh, A Canterbury Tale is a a snapshot of a rural England um, that once you've seen it, you'll pine for for the the rest of your days. It's a a story uh, in the heart of World War II, uh, and it's about what the soldiers were fighting for, really. It's, it's, it's what the country uh, they were defending and what it, mean, what it means to them. I'm Diana. I've lived in Shillam now for 30 years, and I've been interested in the Canterbury Tale always, even before I came here, because it's, it's an allegory, isn't it, of an old, old tale. But uh, Shillam is so historic. We do get quite a lot of... Um, Pilgrims still coming through. I have walked it, not from Winchester, but I've gone from here to Canterbury, uh, followed the same road. Have you done that? Not yet. No? Quite You're going to be busy boys, aren't you? <laughs> I was thinking, sir. Yes? What have we got to do with this old road and the people who travelled along it 600 years ago? Yeah, yeah. Canterbury Tales, of course, that great big founding stone of of the English cultural imagination, is incomplete. Uh, Chaucer died before he could write all the stories he planned to write. He was going to give each character extra stories and take them all the way back to London at the end. Uh, We don't think of it as incomplete because it's such a wonderful sort of thing. But when Powell and Pressburger came along and made the, the wartime film A Canterbury Tale... What they were basically saying was that uh, Chaucer's book isn't so much incomplete, it's just an ongoing process. Every journey to Canterbury is a pilgrimage. Every journey uh, will give you either a blessing or a penance. It's not ancient history. It's, it's continuing. It's a continuing thing. And so what's so, what's so magical to me about, about the Canterbury Tales film is it uh, stops 600-year-old writings from Chaucer um, being put on a shelf and being dismissed as history. They've become part of a tradition, a sort of continuing tradition. And that's what we do on these islands. We, we make journeys to Canterbury, and we, all, and we always will. And we are part of, of, of that same, uh, you know, endless stream of people. 600 years have passed. What would they see, Dan Chaucer and his goodly company today? The hills and valleys are the same. Gone are the forests since the enclosures came. Hedgerows have sprung, the land is under plough, and orchards bloom with blossom on the bough. Sussex and Kent are like a garden fair, but sheep still graze upon the ridges there. The pilgrim's way still winds above the weald through wood and brake and many a fertile field. But though so little's changed since Chaucer's day, another kind of pilgrim walks the way. So, it's time for us to make a pilgrimage. Where are we heading next? Uh, Canterbury. Canterbury. We, sh- we should just be in time for Evensong. Right, so I've got my walking boots on um, and uh, car keys. Let's yeah, go. Good move. <laughs> as they used to be. I've lost most of my teeth. And my heart, my heart is, is breaking and it's the biggest it's ever been. What was interesting um, was in the, in the service we just heard, uh, the, the, the prayers were out for the general election, which is tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, there were prayers for uh, everyone who's standing 
uh, for the democratic process, uh, for, for the whole thing. And it was interesting to compare that to the, the services that, they, uh, that you, you hear um, from the, around the 1940s, from the wartime in Canterbury Cathedral. Um, there was one I refer to in the book. And it sounds specifically like a, um, an argument for the welfare state. So it seems so much more nakedly political then. They're saying that after we defeat the evils of Nazism uh, in World War II, the next step is to defeat the evils of homelessness. And, and lack of jobs and, and social things like that. It seems very odd to um, to a modern uh, person to hear to hear such political words coming from the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, there was a sense that uh, there was a time where the spiritual and the political were aligned, but it took it took uh, World War Two. It took Hitler to do that to us. Much more common is the story we get of Beckett and of Henry, where the uh, political and the spiritual uh, are at each other's throats. It's a struggle for um, authority, really. It's a struggle for power. Do you think the two ever will be realigned? It's, it's, it's certainly difficult to imagine how, now that the, uh, the, the whole church, the Christianity in, in Britain... Um, has, has fallen in, in popularity and, in, in the, you know, the churches are empty on, on, the, on Sundays. It's, it's no longer um, the social force that it was. And it's hard to see it holding politics to account. But there are people who do do that. I mean, obviously, Brian Hall comes in here. This is where we're talking about uh, individuals like that. But it's much more singular individuals rather than a sort of a mass uh, social movement at the moment. It's hard to see how that can change. I think we're going in completely the wrong direction. Oh, but I did sort of... <laughs> I was in full flow. I'm on that pavement since June the 2nd, 2001. We were committing genocide for 11 long years before I came. We've got to stop. I think when you're crossing uh, Kent, travelling along Watling Street as we are, uh, the light of Canterbury is quite a blinding thing. It seems to overshadow all of, all of the county. And you see it in these terms, of, uh, the, you see it through the eyes of all the pilgrims who have gone before. Um, but as, as we were saying earlier, a light does cast shadows. Yeah, this is, uh, we're outside number two West Side Apartments, which is opposite the West Canterbury uh, station. Um, and it's here in 2009 that uh, the writer David Seabrook died. In mysterious circumstances? Well, some would say so. He was certainly involved in some dark, heavy sections um, of society. He was writing about some people who really didn't want to be written about. Uh, and the manuscript that uh, he was working on at the time uh, is lost. It's disappeared. No one knows where, where that is. So, of course, there's going to be rumours. Um, we need an expert on this, don't we? We need, we need someone like the, uh, the writer... Andy Miller, Andy, to fill in the details. Andy Miller, who just lives a few miles up the coast at Whitstable. That's the one. That's the one. Same location as C.J. Stone. And we were talking about Brian Hoare earlier. We were, whose bench, I think, is located in Whitstable. It is, because he was a teenager there. He has family links. And there's a really good ice cream shop. Yeah. So, I mean, we could stay in Canterbury and await our uh, blessing, or we could go to Whitstable. Uh, my name's Andy Miller. I am a reader, author, and editor of books. I am the co-host of the podcast Batlisted, and my most recent book is called The Year of Reading Dangerously, How 50 Great Books, Open Brackets, and Two Not-So-Great Ones, Close Brackets, Saved My Life. And we're here in Whitstable, sat in the back garden of, what is it, the Duke of Cumberland? Is this that right? Is the, yes, this is the Duke of Cumberland. The Duke of, oh. Who gave his name to the sausage, I'm guessing? Yes, in fact, that is part of the hidden psychogeographical history of the town. Uh, the series of sausage-based tribute <laughs> buildings, including this one, the Duke, and then there's the banger around the corner. And uh... <laughs> and you have and you have you have one of your favourite paperbacks here. I do, I do, I do. This is a book called All the Devils Are Here by David Seabrook, 
Um, this was published in 2002. And uh, I first encountered this book. Um, and I think I remember reading a review of it by Ian Sinclair. And Ian Sinclair described a book that sounded totally crazy. It was a book about this part of Kent. All these kind of Medway towns. Mm. And Canterbury. A little bit about Canterbury as well. And at the end of the review, I remember Ian Sinclair used a brilliant phrase, which no one has bettered since to describe this book. And he said, In All the Devils Are Here, David Seabrook gives the reader an ear-bashing he or she will never forget. It sheds a darkness, doesn't it, across the Kent coastline. Is that fair to say? Yeah, he's very good uh, at... What he tends to do is he tends to describe visiting a place... So he talks about going to Broadstairs. Which Broadstairs is mentioned by George Grossmith in Diary of a Nobody. It's the place Mr. Pooter likes to go on his holidays. right? It's the place Charles Dickens liked to come when, when he had a holiday. But Seabrook doesn't want to talk about that. He wants to tell you that there was a house uh, on the, along the cliffs at Broadstairs, which is the basis of the 39 steps, which furthermore became a fascist meeting place in the years up to the Second World War. And one of the people who lived there was William Joyce, a.k.a. Lord Haw Haw. So he takes you to Broadstairs and doesn't show you golden sands and an ice cream. He shows you the link between the Kent um, seaside and Nazi Germany, because he can. <laughs> because he can. And Charles Hawtrey features in the book, doesn't he? A lot. <laughs> He does. Ah, you'll break someone's neck one of these days. Yawn too, I shouldn't wonder. Don't you know there's a bylaw against getting out of a moving train? Penalty 40 shillings. Why don't you light up the names of your stations? How do you expect folks to read the signs? I don't, nor don't the company. I'm here to call out the name of the station. Why wait till the train gets going? Now, look here. In the first place, I call out the name of the station, loud, precise and clear, while the train was stationary. You had ample time to alight, ample. I heard you with my own ears calling out Canterbury after the train started to move. He called out Canterbury next stop. See? But I'm going to Canterbury, darn it. The train's going to Canterbury. And you're stopping here at Chillingbourne. Well, son of a gun. So the book starts in Margate. There's a short essay that starts in Margate. The first essay is sort of based around Chatham. It talks about Charles Dickens in relation to Chatham. Then we go to Broadstairs, as discussed, talks about British fascism in that era. And then the third and final essay, which is by far and away the, the most uh, apparently uncontrolled, though nothing Seabrook does is truly uncontrolled, is set in Deal. Talks about... Um, the craze talks about Charles Hawtrey because Charles Hawtrey, the star of the Carry On films and uh, who I believe I'm right in saying has a minor role in Powell and Pressburger's Canterbury Tale, uh, retired to Deal at the end of his career, lived in Deal, drank himself to de death in Deal... Uh, was reputed to like setting fire to his own bed so firemen would come and rescue him in Deal and was generally, was generally not much liked in Deal and one of the things that Seabrook does is try and <laughs> I don't know quite how to put this impress upon you the reader that what happened to Charles Hawtrey could happen to anyone and there's a really... I don't, I don't want to say how the book ends, but the darkness that you're talking about really begins to encroach on the main narrative as the book comes to an end in terms of stuff that happens in Deal to Seabrook, which even as you're reading it, you're thinking, Is this, did this happen? Is this real? Or do you, are you, have you reached a point of breakdown where this is, this is what has become real to you that you now want to tell me about? And so Hawtrey kind of haunts that section of the section of the book one one uh, notion that's uh, struck us all as we're crossing kent as we are um is that canterbury is uh, such an unavoidable uh, christian shining light in the, in the in the heart of this county at least the way the, the way this road's following us 
uh, this very unavoidable place. It's almost like the that that light casts all the darkness out to the coast of Kent. It always seems to be mm. around the coast that these these these. Uh, I'm thinking of Hastings as well as, as this north. Yeah, well, that is, of course, the tradition with the coast, isn't it? The coast is, uh, I, I, I don't want to word, use the word liminal, but I just have done. Oh, <laughs> the, the coast is a liminal space where these things are, where bad behaviour is permitted. You know, that's true of Brighton. It's certainly true of Hastings. And it's true of a lot of the places that Seabrook talks about in here. So Margate being a classic example, Deal being a classic example. But, you know, the thing about Canterbury, which is very, very interesting, is what you describe as the, the light mm. of Canterbury mm. radiating from the cathedral and its precincts and the, the fact that it is a place of pilgrimage. Actually, Canterbury is, is also has terrible problems with... Uh, homelessness and drug addiction and the fact is that the the C of E owns vast tracts of land in Canterbury but does nothing does very little to actually pour any of the money that might they might get from that land into helping the community in Canterbury and there's a lot of very damaged people in Canterbury also precisely because it is a place of pilgrimage and people who have got ideas in their heads about what God represents to them or what Jesus might represent to them or the sense that they might actually be one of those people where do they go they go to Canterbury and they sleep rough on the streets and so it, it's 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 um darker than 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 you might think you know mm. the other thing you have to understand about this area we're on the edge of Thanet we're in East Kent here but we're on the edge of Thanet mm. One of the reasons why UKIP had, had, I hope, had a stronghold in this part of the world, in Hearn Bay and in Ramsgate, Ramsgate being where Farage stood and failed, narrowly failed to get in, is these are some of the poorest areas in the south of England. There's no industry. All the, all the tourist industry that had existed up until the 1960s and 70s is gone. If you, if you take a walk out of Margate through Cliftonville, it's like, it's like you know, it's J.G. Ballard goes to the seaside. I mean, it is, it's, it's, it's concrete devastation and an ice cream van. Mm. So Seabrook, David Seabrook died about seven or eight years ago. He grew up in Canterbury, he lived in Canterbury, he went to the University of Kent. Mm. And he... Um, you know, I've spoken to a few people who live around here who knew David Seabrook, and it's fairly, it's fair to say that he operated on the fringes of uh, legality in terms of how he made his living. Seabrook published two books and was wor- wor- writing a third when he died. And uh, he was found dead in his flat in Canterbury. And so his first book is All the Devils Here, which we've talked about. His second book is called uh, Jack of Jumps, is a true crime book about the Jack the Stripper murders in 1960s London. Very dark, I mean, really dark book. And he was working on a biography of the show business lawyer David Jacobs, who, amongst other people, represented the Beatles, was a great friend of Brian Epstein's who was found hanged in his garage in the late 1960s. All sorts of rumours swirling around David Jacobs. Anyway, Seabrook was, was working on a book about David Jacobs at the time of his death. The manuscript of that book is missing, mm. as I say this. Various rumours about how David Seabrook met his end. Personally, I'm quite sceptical about those rumours, but I've spoken to people who knew Seabrook who said, you know, he was destined to come to a bad end. Doesn't, it wouldn't surprise... There are people... It, it, you know, all I'm saying is it wouldn't be surprising, totally shocking, if one learnt that, that there were suspicious circumstances around him. But he, he, he operated on the edges, you know, and I've, I've taken the, the mickey slightly by using the word liminal, but actually that's what Seabrook was all about. And, and in a sense... You know, psychogeography is not the literary force that it was 15, 20 years ago, but Seabrook, in a way that I think few other practitioners have managed, was able to cover both the, 
um, the geography and the psycho elements of psychogeography <laughs> in a really, in an almost gonzo way. He's living the things he's talking about. He doesn't want to tell you about local history. He wants to tell you about local history as filtered through how he sees it and filtered by the things that matter to the things about him in terms of the things with which he is obsessed. The peace campaigner, Brian Hoare, who occupied Parliament Square for 10 years, has died from lung cancer. His campaign, which branded leading politicians baby killers, brought him awards, got him arrested, inspired a Turner Prize winning art exhibition and an act of Parliament. Brian Hoare began his Parliament Square protest on June the 2nd, 2001. Before 9-11, Afghanistan and the war against Saddam Hussein, it was Western foreign policy, especially sanctions against Iraq, that provoked this carpenter and former merchant seaman to protest. With his banners and loud hailer, Brian Hoare slept, ate, even washed outside Parliament, to the irritation of many, but not all, inside. You can't see what our bombs do to people anymore. You can't see it. He wasn't the lone weirdo many assumed, but married with seven children. His ever-presence turned him into an icon himself. Um, I'm Chris Stone, uh, known as CJ Stone, written a, a few books, most famous probably Fierce Dancing, uh, which came out in the 90s about the uh, rave culture. I also go under the name Roy Mayo because I'm a postal worker, so I write about postal issues, uh, and I live in Whitstable. I also want us to remember Brian Hoare uh, as, a, as a significant peace campaigner, a, a man of, of, of gr great importance, who... who who the media are attempting to forget now. In 2005, the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act had Hoare in mind when it said demos must have permission of the police before starting. The Home Secretary at the time, David Blunkett, admitted it was a sledgehammer to crack a nut, but Brian Hoare, he said, was a nut and a tough one. So it was before the beginning of the Iraq war. Um, uh, during the sanctions against Iraq, uh, uh, when, when basically, if you remember, Madeleine Albright talking about um, uh, something like a quarter of a million uh, Iraqi kids were dying every month um, or every year, sorry um, and, and uh, she said somebody asked, is the price worth it? and she said, yes, it's worth it basically to stop Saddam Hussein um, <clears throat> so Brian Hoare outraged at this gave up, gave up his life gave up his family moved to Parliament Square um, uh, basically saying he would not live in a house again until uh, the sanctions were finished. And then, of course, after that, the war started. So, uh, you know, in 2003, whenever it was. So, yeah, and, and Brian lived in Whitstable for a, a time and his brother and his mum still live here. So this is the kind of... So he's got a, a, a sort of profound Whitstable connection. that we, we kind of know him as one of ours, as it were. We're heading towards uh, Brian Hoare's bench, which is on the beach down here in Whitstable. Um, we've just misplaced it. I lost it for a while, but I know where it is now, I think. How long's it been here? Um, yeah, about four years, I think. There's a big sort of attempt to raise funds for it, you know, um, and the whole of Whitstable basically chipped in together. Everybody bought uh, tickets, so we all kind of own shares in it, you know. I think it was a pound a ticket or something. Um, if you carry on down here. Yeah, there it is. I can see it now. So it's that, can you see that bench? Oh, yeah. Um, Uh, it's quite a, a striking bench as you approach it, the fact that it's actually on the beach itself rather than sort of tucked away at the back, uh, the fact that it's larger than a normal bench, the fact that the back it sort of swoops up in a sort of dramatic uh, way and the, the carvings like it's the kids wage piece on it. It's, it feels like uh, we've made a pilgrimage to it. And um, when you get there, it, it feels worthwhile. It feels special enough to, to, to justify that. It's quite an imposing and striking object. Do you want to read what it says on the, on the bench, John? It says, in memory of peace campaigner Brian Hoare, 1949 to 2011, with little peace symbols, CND symbols, in the, in the O's and the zeros. And it says, who lived in Whitstable as a teenager. I have to say, it does look 
very similar to Comic Sans, the font that Dave carved that in. I was hoping you weren't going to say that. <laughs> should, we, uh, should we sit down and, yeah. and take in the view? So that's the Isle of Sheppey there, sitting out there. Uh, beyond that, if you see those sort of buildings over there, that's uh, South End on the far side. Stop committing this genocide, this slaughter of the nations, looting the nations. It's about the oil folks. It's about the arms industry. And do you know what? All those poor Arab kids, what did they do wrong? What about our soldiers? We care for those boys. Bring them home right now. These days, whenever, you know, whenever we're like, you're just about to go to war, like we were in Libya a couple of years ago, as you probably remember, uh, and there's any kind of a protest about that, then, then the Brian Hawes bench is the assembly point. So people gather there. And also to remember, to remember Brian Hawes on the anniversary of his death or his birthday, uh, uh, anything to do with kind of the peace movement, um, uh, people will sort of assemble there for various reasons. The last time um, Israel attacked uh, Gaza, for instance, there was a protest there. Um, uh, so it's become kind of um, a focal point for peace energies, if you like. Could you just uh, talk a bit about how long Brian uh, was on the streets in the camp? Okay, yeah, okay. So uh, he went he he went on the streets. So it was before the Iraq War. I think it, it must have been. Uh, I think it must even have been before the war in Afghanistan. So it was during the time of the sanctions. So I think it was probably the end of the 20th century, 1998, 1999. And I think he died uh, 2008, something like this, 2009. So you know, that's a good 10 years he was on the streets. And 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 uh, and the thing to see, if you watch clips of him, this is a, a fierce man. You kind of think of spirituality as something kind of saintly and otherworldly. You know. Um, uh, New age this man was nothing like that. He was fierce. Uh, um, uh, and, and you can imagine the life he must have led on the street. So, you know, late at night, the, the, the cops would come round and they would harass him. They would, you'd get drunken squaddies coming round and kicking his tent down and stuff like this. So he, he really had to defend himself out on those streets, you know. And sometimes he had witnesses... Quite often he was all by himself, you know. So the, the idea of, like, spirituality as some kind of, you know, uh, uh, otherworldly thing is just not true. This man was fully engaged in what he did. Uh, fierce, active, courageous in the extreme. Unforgettable. So, uh, so Brian Hall was basically an evangelical Christian, um, but he was a very inclusive Christian. So, uh, you know, when, when he was interviewed, like, by Al Jazeera or something like this, he would always say, Salam Alaikum, you know, he would always, like, make yeah. the, the Muslim greeting. He understood that his God was the same as their God. There was no division between them. And, and that was the kind of the root of his, his action was, yeah, he was, he, was, he was spiritually moved, you know, to, to give up everything for this cause. You know, it's like, <laughs> so you take a measure of, yeah. of, of political, uh, political activism, you know, your average Marxist, what, which of them are going to give up their whole life and go and live out on the streets for a political ideal? None of them, you know, yeah. basically it takes a certain kind of person. And it's a spiritual thing, that whatever you, however you want to think of that, you know. Yeah, because we, we normally think of spiritually and politically active people as two completely different types. Yeah, yeah. The notion that, that you can be political and spiritual is kind of weird in our, in our society these days. They're, they're, I would say they're two, two ends of a continuum. Brian Hall represents that, that kind of activist, uh, activist spirituality, which, you know, he went, uh, uh, yeah, he, got, he gave up his life for for a, a political ideal and yeah you would not normally consider the two things the same and yet he, he managed to live those out and yet it, it, it's also in the tradition of, of, of a lot of people uh, that, that live their lives that way so Gandhi, Martin Luther King, uh, Leo Tolstoy, you know you can name them there's a, there's a whole string of people uh, and Brian Hoy is definitely in that tradition. Yeah. Um, I suppose the opposite of someone like Tony Blair, who only could become spiritual the moment he, he left office, the moment he sort of stepped away from political power, he, uh, he became Catholic, didn't he? He, he, sort of, he? he had to sort of wait until he'd sort of put down his political work to, to, to become a spiritual person himself. 
Um, I don't think Tony Blair was ever a spiritual person or um, uh, uh, ever had any kind of spiritual inclinations. I think uh, Catholicism is itself very political, has very political elements. I think uh, uh, for Blair, yeah, I mean, in Britain, it's not. It's an embarrassing thing to say that you pray or that you, you that you're, uh, um, you know, you're spiritually inclined. And and uh, and Blair was never courageous enough to admit that he did these things. Brian Hall lived his life in opposition specifically to Tony Blair with courage and conviction against the decisions that somebody like Blair that Blair was making you know one of the lines I have one of the understandings I have is okay uh, politics and spirituality you could say are, are they the same no they're not the same they're two ends of a continuum but in, the, in that sense they're conjoined as it were um, uh, like a lot of oppositions uh, um, you know like so worldly and otherworldly or ambitious and uh, and uh, I idealistic you know um uh, and, and those two people blair and brian hoare to me represent those two oppositions brian hoare who lived his life in a sacrificing way who sacrificed his whole life uh, uh for a for a, a political belief a spiritual belief and tony blair who was quite willing to sacrifice other people's lives for his own ambition yeah, and of course, Tony Blair goes on to become incredibly wealthy, to become incredibly connected, to be, be part of the establishment. And as far as the media seem to be concerned, Brian Hoare is someone to be forgotten, someone, you know, that, that uh, is, is no longer important or relevant. So I guess that's why seeing that the people of Whitstable uh, think otherwise and, and put their hand in the pocket to build this, this bench as a, as a memorial to him is, is kind of inspiring, really. And it's, I mean... The, the similarities between the story of uh, King Henry and, and Thomas Beckett uh, strike me very strongly. Uh, writing about Canterbury, visiting, visiting Canterbury, sort of like that. It's the notion that um, a saint rates above uh, a king. You know, uh, King Henry had to come and humble himself in front of the shrine of, of Thomas, um, even though Thomas was lowly born in from the streets of London and, and you know, Henry was a king. Uh, a, a saint in, in the eyes of time uh, is higher and more important uh, and, and that's who we'll remember that's absolutely it yeah um, uh, uh, the, the saint is the one we remember uh, but, but, the, but the ambitious person the non-saint as it were the Tony Blair the Henry II the man of power gives everything up for what he can gain in this world that's the difference isn't it it's the otherworldly and the worldly yeah. and again the, the, the difference between them um, uh, the the, the saint, the saintly person, is somebody who is willing to die for his beliefs, uh, as Brian Hall was and showed it, give up everything, uh, uh, um, died on the streets of London, in a sense died on the streets of London. It was London that killed him, the, the pollution um, and the stress of his life, because, he, you know, that was a really stressful life that he lived. And then Tony Blair, uh, a, a man who is willing to kill for his beliefs uh, um, a man is willing to make decisions where he knows people are going to die and the same you know Henry II it's a very very similar parallel Do you think there could ever be forgiveness for someone like Tony Blair if he was to make a pilgrimage to this bench of Brian Hall maybe to lay down some flowers or or to sit in contemplation would you think his uh, his uh, eternal soul would uh, uh, shine brightly after that. I think that's a fascinating question. I mean, uh, so Henry II actually, uh, did, did, when he did his pilgrimage to to Canterbury, which he was forced to do in the end, uh, um, uh, he did it on his knees. He, uh, I, I think he he, he 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 made himself suffer. He had to visibly suffer for what he'd done. He, he lashed himself. He whipped himself. Yeah. Um, so I think if Tony Blair was to come here and lash himself, we, 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 we might we might consider forgiving him. So in terms of in terms of Watling Street, Watling Street is about six miles south of here, right? And I I actually think that. I, but my guess is that probably people who did that old pilgrimage may well have come to Whitstable at one stage. So we've got a kind of connection. This is in the region. It's not far from Canterbury. Uh, but there's also like a distinct parallel that, uh, between um, Brian Hall on the one hand, Thomas the Beckett, and then Henry II and Tony Blair. So I make this kind of distinct parallel between, uh, as it were, the worldly and the otherworldly, the, 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 the political and spiritual and, and, and the, the, the kind of the, the, that dynamic that exists, you know. Um, 
Uh, and I think sort of Brian Hall represents, as it were, a modern Thomas a Beckett. And, um, and I, I suppose part of the reason of wanting to talk about him is that we, we want everybody to remember who he was and what he did, you know, because it was equal in his, in his own way to what Thomas a Beckett did back in the 11th, 12th century, whenever it was. So that's the, that's the connection. This is maybe a place of new pilgrimage, the bench, Brian, Brian Hall's bench on Whitstable Beach. It certainly was for us. That's, that's why we came here as a pilgrimage. There's another connection, of course, in that the peace camp that Brian Hall set up was at Westminster, which was on the original pre-Roman uh, route at Watling Street. That was the, the ford over the Thames. So, so he came uh, from Whitstable, the six miles to Watling Street, and then along in that direction to uh, Westminster, which is, which is where he spent the last years of his life. Sergeant, the gloom man's But tonight in Parliament Square, if some breathe a sigh of relief that he won't be coming back, there is still a chair out for Brian Hall. These ancient pilgrims came to Canterbury to ask for a blessing or to do penance. You, I hope, are on your way to secure blessings for the future. Street Podcast was presented by David Bramwell and John Higgs and was produced by David Bramwell. The book Watling Street is published by Weidenfeld and Nicholson and is available from all good bookshops, especially those within a five mile radius of the A2 and the A5. Music and the title track Watling Street was by Oddfellows Casino and features on their latest album O Sealand, which is well worth spending your pocket money on. To find out more about John and David, visit drbramwell.com and johnhiggs.com. Further podcast featuring the dynamic duo can be found on Auditorium Podcast at oddpodcast.com. This podcast was funded by Arts Council England. If you liked it, please leave a review for us on iTunes. Music